Hey everybody, Dave McKeown here. Thank you so much for tuning in to another episode of Lead Like You Give a Damn, where I speak with leaders and leadership experts and we answer the question, where do we go from here? If you're joining us on the live stream, we go live uh, at 9 a.m. on Fridays, specific time across LinkedIn. Um, and we're now experimenting with uh, LinkedIn events actually. So if you're on the events page, awesome to have you here. We also go live across uh, YouTube and Facebook. Uh, so great to have you here if you're with us on the live stream, if you're listening to this on iTunes or Spotify or Anchor um, at a later date, great to have you here as well. Uh, just so thankful and happy that you could join us. I'm super excited about my guest this morning, um, a, a guy that I know that you're going to appreciate and grow to be fond of as much as I have in the period of time that I've got to know him. Um, Henry Evans is the CEO of Dynamic Results. Henry, thank you so much for joining me this morning. How are you? Uh, it's been a good, good, extremely busy week, and I, I feel good. How are you? I am just doing wonderful. It's Friday. We're inching towards the weekend. It's sunny in Southern California, so I've got very little to complain about. Um, Henry, I would love to hear from you. A uh, question I ask all my guests at the beginning uh, is, what are you best known for? So I think if that was asked in a business context, um, probably follow the line of what I keynote on, um, how to drive accountable cultures and accountability. The concept we published of emotional safety and implementing strategy on probably the professional and personal side using too many uh, martial arts metaphors. <laughs> Excellent. Well, I hope that you litter this interview with a whole bunch of martial arts metaphors. So you talked about two things there, accountability and emotional safety. Um, accountability is one of those terms that's just bandied around a lot in, in the world of leadership and has been for, for millennia, probably. Emotional safety, maybe not as much um, as accountability, certainly from, from my perspective. Um, break those two down. What's the difference between the two of them? How do they link together? Um, and, and, and what do you do to help leaders and teams kind of adopt that sort of culture? So when we published Winning with Accountability, which is an intellectually simple book, it's, it's a 75 minute read. We did not anticipate a bestseller. We thought of it as kind of a, almost a workbook for our clients. Right. And in hindsight, we look back and think that the reason it's gotten so much traction is that we really shifted people's mindsets from thinking about accountability as a punitive concept and actually implementing it as a positive one in the business. Right. So it, it's not a why to, it's a how to set up best practices to mm. improve performance at the individual and organizational level. Emotional safety, I published after Dr. Colin Foster um, finished his five year PhD study of high performing organizations and people. And what he found in the academic study proved what we learned in our case studies, which is that high performing people uh, do and don't do certain things. And that's consistent across gender, country of origin, uh, uh, industry. Mm -hmm. And we found that all of it is built upon this concept we published called the emotional safety. And simply put, it means that you can drive high performance. That's accountability. Mm -hmm. But you have to do it in a way that makes people feel safe even rewarded when they're bringing you bad news. And that right. bad news can be about you or I as leaders. So it, it could be that they feel encouraged to come and tell us when we're messing up. And the right. power of emotional safety, when I'm, when, when I'm keynoting, I'm basically saying, some of you out there are altruistic, you wanna make the world a better place, and some of you are, are, are capitalists. I don't care what mm -hmm. your motivation is. If you create emotional safety, you'll be more informed when, when making decisions, you'll get better results, you'll have better relationships, and you'll satisfy both needs. Right. And, and so what are some of the key challenges for building emotional safety um, amongst teams? Where, where does it break down? So emotional safety, I, I mean, Dave, why don't we personalize it and keep it at the individual level for the individual listener? Sure. Um, so vulnerably, transparently, when I slip and I damage emotional safety, I might do it now in the interaction we're having, but I could have also done it a number of times in the past. And because you have felt burned in past interactions with me, mm -hmm. you, you're approaching my office with an apprehension about being open and transparent. So, so we ask people to kind of slip the context of time and know that you might have pretty much effed it up in the past, even if you're doing well now, and you right. might have to overcome yourself. 
but people might have been burned by other leaders they've they've worked with or or other colleagues. People could have had childhood trauma. Right. Um, our our egos. If I've worked really hard on something to prove that I'm right, and now you're coming in with evidence that I'm not as right as I thought I was, my uh -huh. ego is screaming, "Don't listen to Dave." Right. That's it's fascinating. So there's there's actually two sides of that coin then on emotional safety. There's there's the the I, I mean I don't know maybe you can enlighten me on how you distinguish, but there's the person who f feels emotionally safe towards me or not, and then there's me, I guess. But there's two sides of that coin. There's 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 me and what I do to try to make that happen, but there's also the other person, their past experiences, their viewpoint of me, um, you know, just that their lifetime of experience. Um, how do I take ownership to ensure that I'm creating an emotionally safe environment when there's somebody else involved that I can't control, I have no control over their thoughts, their feelings, their experiences, how they've been burned and how they view me. It almost feels like there's less that I can control than I can control. Share with me how we overcome that. So I love the question because you actually answered an earlier question you, you asked me, which is how do you integrate accountability and emotional safety? And one of the 12 tools in our accountability method is um, this filter to decide what you can control, what you can only influence, and what you have no control or influence over. So you're right. You have no control or influence over my childhood or how my right. parents treated me. Or, you know, I was a chronic stutterer as a kid who got beat up a lot. You can't control that. Right. But there are some things you can do when I come in to your office. One is that you can be genuinely curious in my point of view, even if you don't agree with my data. Right. Um, so you have to be grounded in curiosity and interest in, in not just what I'm saying, but how I might be feeling. Mm -hmm. um, you also might, if you hear an idea for me that you don't like, practice something we published in, in the book, Step Up, called attack the idea or behavior, not the person. Right. So you might say something like, Henry, I love you. I love working with you. Um, and I usually like your ideas. I'm really struggling to see how the idea you just put on the table is going to help us generate cash flow in a pandemic. Right. So it's not about the person. It's it's about just taking that idea and putting, let's look at this rather than let's look at let's look at you, which can be helpful because it depersonalizes their perspective or their opinion, right? Yeah, and, and Dave, you, you just did something that we teach in the training. I just saw you move your hands and you, we almost objectified the idea. Right. So you might, you might physically, if you're in the same space, you can, you can take a tissue box or a coffee cup and say, you know, this idea that, that you just gave us about cash flow, let's take a look at that. I'm not sure how it would work when our, when our supply chain is disrupted the way it currently is. Mm -hmm. um, I, I love that the whole concept of, of uh, emotional safety. I've got two thoughts in my in my mind. The first one, let's just keep it on the individual. Um, I'm sure you come across this a lot, and I think I fit into this camp where so long as my intent is good, if somebody is misrepresenting that or misunderstanding that and how that comes across, I, I have a tendency to to shy away from overdressing something up or being overly concerned about where the other person is necessarily coming from because my intentions are actually quite good and honorable. And so if there's an issue, it's your job to kind of flag that for me. Is there a sense where that's kind of a, a wrong or a not as opportune perspective to take? Should, should I be a little bit more slower and a bit more um, curious about the other person's perspective? Well, I don't know. I think it depends on the, on the situation and on your relationship with the person. I think it depends on the subject matter. There's always the context of are we or are we not in a crisis? And the word crisis is subjective. But in a, when we teach in the emotional safety training when to fight, when to have constructive conflict, we say that if it's about, let's say that you just spoke in a way I didn't like in a meeting. So, so the conflict could be about personality in the moment. Mm -hmm. We say in a crisis, don't have that conversation. We don't have the calories to burn about not having liked your tone. If it's about a process that might help us emerge out of, out of or through the crisis, we might want to dedicate a couple of hours to debate and arrive at the, our best idea of what the right process is. Right. And if it's about long-term strategy, fight all day until you've got the solution you need and then start execu executing it. But if we're not in crisis, 
me not liking your tone, particularly if it's a pattern, is something that I should learn to address with you. If it's incidental, I approach it in a lighthearted, incidental way. Right. If, it, if it's a pattern, we, we teach something called um, elevating. And that might be me saying, Dave, um, I've noticed over the last year this tendency you have to interrupt me when I'm offering my ideas in meetings. And um, I don't think you mean to do that, but I feel like you're doing it a lot and it's starting to bother me and I don't want that resentment to build. So what can we do about it? Right. And and so you do teach on both sides of the coin how to how to address those those issues and building that culture of emotional safety. Both if you're feeling like you're not emotionally safe and if you're projecting a, a lack of safety onto to somebody else. Am yeah, I, right? I, I love this about your podcast because having watched a few episodes, you 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 really dig into these concepts and you're hitting into what we teach in the mastering emotional safety, which is. You know, most of what we teach in emotional safety is how do you create that for for others? We go deeper in 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 mastering. Now, let's say that let's let's flip the script. You've approached me with constructive feedback a few times, and I have been forget if I'm your boss or not. I could be your coworker. I could be your direct report, but I am the most difficult person you know to mm -hmm. give feedback to. And each time you're thinking about giving me feedback, you're having a drink the night before and you're eating <laughs> big breakfast the morning of and you're meditating and you're grounding yourself and you're trying to call out your, your highest self and you're calling on your higher power. If I'm that person in your circle, I'm limiting my own career. Right. Because my brand, the reputation I'm building is that I might be great at producing metrics, but I also burn a lot of other people's calories. Mm. And so part of it is how easy can you make it? How, how, how rewarded can you make other feel regardless of title or hierarchy when they're trying to give you data that you could potentially use to improve your position or um, the position of the organization? Got it. Yeah, I, I, I love that. I love that notion of burning, you know, collective calories in, in a team, just wasting energy. Um, I can imagine it's one of those... Um, skill sets that for a lot of people is is difficult to just start because they're not used to taking that step forward and, and being bold in those moments what, what what are your thoughts or tips on just how, how you start to to build some of that emotional safety to address some of those conversations that need to be had if you're not operating in a culture where that's kind of allowed or or not allowed but you know not not necessarily accepted that 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 that's a great and huge question, right? So <laughs> that, that could be a that that could be a whole afternoon of, of training. So let me see if I can shrink this down. So let me make some sweeping and possibly insulting generalizations. So some people will say that we can't put human beings into two categories. Sure. Agreed, but the, I'm going to do that right now um, to save time. Let's just think in terms of people who lean towards extroversion and people who lean towards introversion. I would answer your question differently for those two groups. If right. you're the type A outgoing extrovert, we say don't address it while you're upset. Like sleep overnight, maybe write the email you want to write with all the F-bombs in it, but no name in the two box. Right. Write the Slack message, but, but don't have it possibly being sent accidentally. And then the next morning, come back, read it. You've gotten those feelings out, write the message you want to write or write down what you want to say. For the introverts uh, or people who like to think out loud, we recommend that they write down the outcome they're trying to achieve mm -hmm. and then reverse engineer what would most likely, if said, help them achieve that outcome. Mm -hmm. And again, sleep on it overnight. Few, few frustrations need to be addressed in the moment if you're not already masterful at doing that right yeah i i agree with that i think the, the worst thing you can do is barge in and start screaming or shouting or, or think you've got a handle on it and then you know you do that awful thing where your voice starts cracking and you go red and you're like are there actual tears coming out of my eyes and then you need to you know excuse yourself and go go off to the bathroom i've certainly been in circumstances like that in the past um what do you say to people who you say henry look henry look, this is great you guys are on the west coast of California. There's a lot of, you know, hippy dippy feel good stuff out there, making sure everybody's comfortable. We've got a business to run. We're in the middle of a literal crisis right now. I don't have time for any of this. How do you respond to that? Well, first of all, uh, I am looking at a bunch of empty buildings in downtown San Francisco right now, but I'm born and raised in Brooklyn. Right. And um, I come from, a, here's your first martial arts 
reference. Um, I, I come from a, a, a 26 year competitive martial arts background. So I believe, and so does Colm, he's a judo black belt as well as a PhD. We think that you do what works and you don't do what doesn't work. So what, why is one of our client or organizations about to train their 350 top leaders in emotional safety? Why is another client or organization about to train their top 300 in emotional safety? Well, maybe in a pandemic when when stresses are highest, people are locked at home with their kids. They could have sick relatives. They could be sick themselves. Um, they might have had their pay cut. They they might have been furloughed and mm -hmm. they're just coming back. They might be afraid to come back. The ability to make people feel safe expressing how they really feel will restore them to a state where they can receive and transmit data in a way that serves the organization. And if we don't address how they're feeling, we're asking them to do something that's simply inhuman. We're asking them to be a robot, right. to park all this pent up feeling that they may have, ignore it, and just work on a, on a spreadsheet. Yeah, It doesn't make sense. Yeah, and I think one of the things, one of the, my hopes that will be the silver lining from all of this is that we do return to a more human-centered approach to leadership. Um, that that because collectively we're going through a trauma, I think we've allowed um, the notion of of ensuring emotional safety to be more accepted than it was before on a micro level, because it was always just little sparks of it in different people. And, and, but we, but we weren't all going through something together at the same time, but now, you know, we're literally all in this, this, this time of, of, of trauma. And, and I'm, I hope by the back end of it, we will be a little bit more compassionate. We will be a little bit more vulnerable. We will be a little bit more transparent. What do you think the sticking and staying power of that is? Will we emerge from this a better group of people or do you feel we'll return to our older ways of, of leading and managing? Well, my dad would have said when he was alive, um, the outcome is certain. We either will or we won't. And we'll find <laughs> out then. But um, I'll try to give a more specific answer. He was a little existential in his thinking. <laughs> I think we're going to come back on a curve. So one of the things that Colin's research showed is that the, there is a superpower that the highest performing people had. And we didn't only study companies. We studied the Jesuit order. We studied the United States Marines. We studied um, com companies all over the world. They actually had this counterintuitive super move that they can make, which was when feeling frustrated or scared or unhappy or critical, they would express it and they would express it with emotion. Mm -hmm. But they were able to remain intelligent during that expression, and that's the difference. Most of us, when we come back and we start to express how we feel, we might do that in a regrettable way, right? right. So we weren't we weren't our highest self. My sense is we're going to see the full bell curve. We're going to mm -hmm. see people that come back um, frustrated and unforgiving. Say if 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 they had a cut in compensation or didn't want to be forced back into their office or didn't want to be forced to work from home. Mm -hmm. And we'll have other people that have a high solution orientation and want to get stuff done. So I don't know how different it'll be. What do you think? What do you think it's going to look like when, when people come back? I, I, I want to say, yeah, ditto to what you said. Um, I have a hope and a belief that there'll be enough of a tipping point of leaders, hopefully from my generation and the younger below, I was talking to somebody the other day about um, millennials and, you, you know, my perspective and opinion on, on the millennial group. Um, you know, you just think about the, the sheer number of massive global shifts that that generation has experienced from um, the dot-com crash, 9-11, the Great Recession, and, and now this. Um, feels like there's a lot of big cultural economic shifts that we've underwent. And as we emerge into the leaders of our organizations, you know, we're 40 at the top end, we'll start companies, we're leading them and so forth. To, I, my hope is that there'll be a tipping point of, of that generation below that will adopt more of a, of a human-centered way of leading. That the final relics of maximizing shareholder value will start to slide away and that we will pursue that we won't pursue growth for the sake of growth as it pertains to profits, but that we will pursue growth for the sake of growth as it pertains to people. I'm an idealist. 
you know, but but culturally and societally, it feels like there's a movement in that direction. But I don't know. I mean, because the whole thing can get taken uh, underneath us again. Yeah, and so I would say in terms of what we promote when we're working with, with C-suite and leadership teams, that won't change. Mm. We, we've always said that, again, it, if you're altruistically motivated or you're more capitalistically motivated, making an emotionally safe environment will get you better business results and better relationships. You'll retain right. top talent longer. And speaking about um, the millennials uh, that, that you are a part of and that you just mentioned, um, they don't stay as long in, in companies as a lot of people my age and older. And one way to perhaps invite people to stay longer is to have their experience and their relationship to others be enjoyable enough that they don't want to leave it. And that is not about shareholder return. It will lead to shareholder return, but, but, but it's, but, but it's not the motivation. So that's an interesting point though. Why, why would the goal be, or why should the goal be to retain our people for longer? I mean, I know that that is, that's been the notion for a long time, but, but like, but why? Because well, I've got a counterpoint to it. Yeah, of course. So, so the word longer is subjective. So I'm not talking about taking people who might stay with you, you know, say an average of, of three to five years and extending that to 15 or 20. But I'm saying that, and I'm also talking about top talent, because I have a feeling that, and this is how I advise our clients, I want your low performing, culturally cancerous people to be gainfully employed by your competitor. So, so I want them to have a full-time job, just not with, with us. And I'm saying if we have top talent and we can make three years, four years, or two years, three years, we both get a benefit from, from each other for a slightly extended window. But I'm not, I'm not talking about reversing a global trend of, of lower tenure. Right. Because we're never going to get to the point where people say stay 10, 15 years. And I think that the notion should be that, that, that if you're set up to, um, it deal to, to both recruit um, and then hire top talent to put them to incredible great use in your organization and then develop them and give them the option to either stay because they love you or go on to something greater and better. Surely that is the, that's a positive way to create that environment where, you know, they, they, they will love you no matter what. Um, yeah. I'm speaking more that let's say that, you're my boss and you create an emotionally safe environment. We're a high performing team. Uh, somebody else offers me a few euros more or a few rupees more to join their organization. And it could be uh, as I'm weighing my options, but I go, you know what? I think I'm going to stick another year out with Dave. Um, Cause I don't get the same vibe from this other or organization and you get mm -hmm. one more year out of me. That's all I'm saying. Yeah, no, I, I, get, I get it. Um, I'd love to return to the notion of accountability because it's clear there's a connection between emotional safety and accountability and that the absence of emotional safety makes it very difficult to, to build a culture of accountability. But that, that can't surely be the be all and end all. There's got to be some other stuff around that. What, what else do the listeners need to consider in terms of their own leadership um, to help them build more of a, of a culture of, of ownership and accountability? So, so this, this idea, this response may offend some listeners. Um, I hope it encourages more people than it offends. But we say that you might want to think about burning the org chart in terms of high performing behaviors, that, that you shouldn't just be looking to your leaders for them. And your leaders shouldn't just be looking at, at their workforce for results, that, that, that an organization is an organism. And um, there is a type of specificity. And if we're using very specific language when we're making requests and or giving commitments, we call it the secret language of high performing organizations. Our results are better. We have fewer relationship failures. We have fewer project failures because we took that extra time to get super specific on the front end of a relationship or a project plan. And as our listeners are thinking about relationships that have been strained or failed, even personal ones. If you went to a therapy session, the therapist would say, well, if you could go back in time, is there something you would have, you wish you had known then mm. that you only learned later? And everyone says yes. So we say, let's front load. We call it front loading as much data as we can before we start the work, before we start right. investing shareholder dollars or right. calories. 
and we will have less work to, to redo or clean up. Does no. that answer your, it, your, it, your it, question? Yeah, it does. I, I love that. I, I'd love to just make then a, a, a transition kind of in our focus and, and ask you, what, what's changed for you over the last two months, either personally, professionally, and what, are, what, are, what have you learned as a result of that? Oh, Dave, so much has changed. Um, if you had asked me in January if dynamic results should, never mind could, take our 16 year process of doing quarterly strategic planning and implementation sessions with leadership teams and suddenly start doing it remotely or even ever do it remotely uh -huh. so you to see through Zoom, I would have said we can't do it. And I'm an optimist. I mean, I, I believe I would win every martial arts match. Um, but I would have said we, we can't do it and we shouldn't do it. It has to be 3D in person the way we've always done it. Then with this pandemic, we had eight days to keep a client. Mm -hmm. by delivering one of these sessions remotely. And we completely transformed the organization. So, so what changed for me is I was put in this pressure cooker to practice what I've been preaching for 16 years, which is trust my subject matter experts in the firm. Mm. And we went through this complete digital transformation, which required skills and tactics that I don't personally have right. and that people on our team do. So I didn't just have to step back. I had to be put out of the room. <laughs> as, as we built this new process. And then I had to be trained by the people who built it to deliver it. And we did that. We, we, we delivered our first remote session in, in eight days. So that, that, that level of trust was scary as an owner and investor. Uh -huh. and, I, and I'm glad I had it. And, and our people were incredible. That's that's awesome to hear. I'm sure it was it was um, both humbling and massively rewarding at the same time. Whenever you came back and, and saw how good they were able to do that, um, I think one of the things that I'm noticing and and seeing is that to make this work, to make anything that worked offline in the past, it's not about replicating the experience online. Sure, there might be elements of that that cross over, but it's not about taking your PowerPoint deck and then just presenting it through Zoom. It's about crafting much more of a digital experience, a virtual experience, which is is, is a different perspective. It's a different way of, of doing things. Is it, it, would you kind of confirm that perspective? Well, I mean, it's confirmed in that it's now going to be a permanent part of our offering. We are now scaling that new part of the business. And by the way, the clients who may have shared my apprehension about doing it that way have already signed up for their next quarterly session to be in a remote format. So we and our clients, uh, many of whom say they enjoy the remote experience better. Right. Um, now, I don't know if that's sustainable, but we're certainly going to find out over time. <laughs> That's great. Awesome to hear that you're able to, to make that, that shift and that pivot. Um, just as we're coming to a close, we'd love to hear from you. Have you got a particular resource, a book, a bit of music, a movie, a game, an app, a tool, a recipe that has been particularly helpful for you over the last couple of weeks? Well, I'm going to skip music because I do about, I don't know, six to eight hours a week of active listening. That's a form of no screens, just listen. And I listen right. to a, a lot of genres. Um, I'm rereading um, a book I had the honor of reading an advanced copy of, by full disclosure, a friend and colleague, Michael Bunye Stanier, um, The Advice Trap. Yep. I read the advanced copy to, to give an endorsement, but I'm, but I'm rereading it again. And Michael and I um, will be doing two sessions on the 20th and 27th about the, we're calling it the four impossible tensions of leading in a crisis. Okay. So, so his, his insights have been helpful, but I'm going to argue with them in these two sessions we're doing. Excellent. Do yes. I don't think Michael gets enough people um, uh, positing um, arguments to his theories and perspectives. He needs he needs a bit of debate in that in that regard. So I'll be listening actively to see how you do that. Um, awesome. Yes, the advice trap is a great it's a great book. Michael's um, uh, put a lot of really good um, perspectives and thoughts on curiosity in there. Uh, finally, Henry, um, what else would you like to share that would make this a complete experience for you? Um. I am hoping that that this emergence of uh, humanity that that we are seeing globally in this crisis, and that and and that some for-profit organizations are starting to really lead with, to your earlier point, is sustainable. And I think that that's a choice all of us have to make. Yeah. Our little contribution to it was we took early on, early March, our accountability challenge and emotional safety challenge, and and just made them free so people can go to dynamicresults.com and they can take the accountability or emotional safety challenge. 
which are mini e-schools mm. for free, and it's not edutainment, you, they will leave with mitigation strategies for a current challenge. Right. Um, and I hope that more organizations are doing that. If a couple of EBITDA points um, donated result in a huge lift in the experience and quality of life for people, I'm hoping that the people who hold the purse strings will do more of that. Love that. So dynamicresults.com for those two um, programs that you mentioned? Yeah, if you go to um, dynamicresults.com to either eSchool page, you'll see a button that says take the challenge and you can do that for free. Okay, awesome. Well, Henry, thank you so much for joining me this morning. It was a, a wonderful conversation. I know everybody listening is going to get a lot of value out of it. Um, so thank you for being gracious with your time and your expertise. I appreciate it and hope you have just a wonderful weekend. Oh, Dave, thanks for having me and back at you.